for coming. And also, hello to everybody who is connected uh, remotely. Uh, this session that we do today, it's part of the Friday Talks at the, at the Marine Science Institute, but it's also part of the symposium, which is a series of uh, marine talks that are organized by different centers of marine research in Spain. Today we have Ramiro Logares as the speaker. Ramiro did the degree in biology in Bariloche in Argentina. Then he moved to Sweden to perform the, the, the PhD in, at Lund University. Did the first postdoc still in Sweden in Uppsala. And then he moved here to, to the ICM in 2010 when he has had all the different grants that you may have. Finally, he got the position in two, the, two years ago. Uh, when he defines himself, Ramiro says in his bio biographical sketch that I am, uh, I am leading a research team on microbial computational ecology and evolution. And I think this summarizes very well what he is. He's a microbial ecologist, but he uses a lot of computational power, uh, also with a strong interest in big data, to analyze patterns in the environment. So, Ramiro, thank you for your talk. So thank you very much, Ramon, for the invitation. I, I was checking uh, the other day, the last Friday talk I gave, it was 2010. So it's been a while. And I think, um, yeah, there, no? It's better? OK. Yeah. So it's been a few years already. Um, so I mean, at that time, I was presenting something on lakes. And today is going to be more about uh, microbes and, and the ocean. Um, so the ocean is populated by a huge number of uh, microbes. And I don't think you are an audience that I need to convince to about that. But um, we have 10 to the 30 viruses, 10 to the 29 prokaryotes, 10 to the 28 eukaryotes, and so on. So um, to give you a, um, a reference, I mean, there's about 10 to the 24 stars in the universe. So it's, a, it's a, an amazing number of uh, microbes. And in terms of biomass, I mean, microbes are the most important component in the ocean as well. We have, there's an, a recent estimate saying that about 60% of the ocean biomass is uh, microbial. So this is something uh, quite important as well, because this is something we don't see, but they are predominant in terms of biomass as well. Then when we think on ecosystem function, microbes are, um, they have a fundamental importance as well. They are responsible for about 50% of the planetary primary production. They are crucial for uh, the marine trophic webs and then also fundamental for biochemical cycles. Here what we have is um, well, um, chlorophyll in different parts of the ocean, seen from space, and this comes all from, from microbes, basically. Now, we could think that um, this was known for quite a long time, but actually the importance of microbes in the ocean is something that became evident not so long ago. So still is, um, could be considered something uh, relatively new in terms of uh, knowledge. So um, let's say that during the past decades, 50, 70 years, we learn a lot on uh, microbes on the earth, in the ocean as well. And we could answer several questions, but there are still several quite interesting questions that are still unanswered, or we have a partial knowledge about them. So in this talk, I'm gonna just address three of them. And I'm gonna, um, it's not gonna be a comprehensive development of each of these questions, but mostly, I'll try to highlight some of the research we've been doing. Um, so the first question is how do microbes evolve and form populations and species? Second one is uh, which microbes interact and how? And then the last one is how much functional redundancy is present in microbial ecosystems? So um, let's start with the uh, first one. What we see in, in microbes is that there's, uh, or there has been a massive evolutionary diversification. In terms of species, there are estimates of 10 to 12 prokaryotic species on Earth, 
and 10 to the 12 in the ocean. Remember that species, not, not um, cells. I mean, it's a huge uh, number. When it comes to genes, um, there are also estimates of about 45 million for the uh, surface global ocean. Unique genes is unique genes or non-redundant. And um, then with the same data and changing the bioinformatics uh, pipeline, we could increase this number of genes for the global ocean to, to uh, 148 million. So the number itself is just to show how many are there. So all these genes represent all the diversification that has been going on. And if we were looking at more detail, we would uh, see uh, more uh, gene swells. And then the question is how this diversity, uh, diversity emerge. Um, there are different mechanisms. I'm not going to go through all uh, of them, but I'm going to mention adaptive diversification as one of the most important mechanisms. So adaptive diversification is basically um, diversion or heterogeneous selection, driving populations apart, and then eventually leading to new species. There are a few examples from uh, macroorganisms, especially birds. I mean, there are quite a few examples, but one of them is from, uh, for example, this how, uh, bird from the Hawaiian Islands, that from one single ancestor, there were uh, adapted species that emerged. I mean, some species are specializing in, for example, picking nectar, others in insects and crushing seeds and so on. And the size or, or the shape of the pig is showing let's say, the different niches that uh, they have. When we move, up, uh, move back to microbes, um, this process of adaptive diversification can be facilitated by their huge population uh, sizes, I mean, the, the, the number of individuals within populations, and also the large uh, genetic diversity that is contained with this, this population. So their reaction to selection can be faster than, for example, in um, multicellular organisms. So now I'm going to tell you a story, uh, something that we have been working in here at the ICM, and it's uh, about the diversi diversification of tiny little ocean predators. So I'm presenting you uh, here MAS4. MAS4 was discovered by Ramon about 20-something years ago, I guess. Um, and it's basically uh, a little cell with a flagella. Um, it's uh, predominant about, uh, among heterotrophic flagellates, about, I mean, they can be up to 9% of, of this group. They have small cell size, uh, they are planktonic, they eat bacteria, they are important in the marine food web, they channel carbon energy to up, uh, upper trophic levels, and they are globally distributed. Now, when we look at the phylogeny of this group, here we have all the stramenopiles, here we have mass four, and then we have different uh, species. Now, when I came here to the ICM uh, in 2010, we were discussing with Ramon whether these were uh, ecotypes or species. Uh, but I'm not going to go farther on this. I'm going to just tell you more about this later. To investigate mass 4 we use data from large oceanographic expeditions that most of you know, Tara Oceans and, and the Malaspina expedition. And the first thing that we saw when looking at the distribution of these species based on metabarcoding, I mean, looking at the small fragments of the 18S uh, gene, how they distribute in the ocean, we saw that different, we could identify uh, the different species, at least four of them, not all of them, which is mass for A, B, C, and E. And what um, was interesting was that um, we could start to see different distribution. I mean, it wasn't that they were kind of randomly distributed, but they started to show some patterns. As you can see, for example, mass for A was uh, more present in subtropical areas uh, than mass for C seem to be more predominant in tropical areas. So we start to zoom in into, into that. And actually, this is one example where you could see a little bit of a transition between, for example, mass 4 uh, C and B in tropical areas to a higher predominance of mass 4 A in subtropical areas. So we start to think that they could have different niche temperatures. For example, uh, mass 4 C and B more present in tropical zones, mass 4 A most present in uh, subtropical zones. So then we run some network analysis, co-occurrence and co-exclusion. And this is a, this tiny network here shows 
uh, for example, that uh, mass for A is co-excluding, as we were expecting, with mass for C and B, and mass for C and B were uh, co-occurring. So um, this was a quite interesting pattern. And then we uh, continue uh, exploring the genome, trying to see where we could um, find some hints of this distribution there. But uh, for that, I need to tell you something before, which is that um, these uh, species are very well differentiated. I mean, I mentioned before that we thought that there might have been ecotypes, but not really. Um, when we look at the average amino acid identity between the genomes of these four species, the uh, amount of divergence was ranging between 51% ranging between to 71%. So this indicates very well defined lineages. They are not really um, ecotypes from the same population. Then we run phylogenomics and, and we compare with the average amino acid identity and we, we got the same, um, let's say, evolutionary diversification pattern with mass for A and B being more closely related than C and, and, and E. So these species are genomically quite different. Then we said, said well, let's dig in more into the uh, functions that are encoded by this um, genome, by these four species. So here again, we have mass for A, B, uh, C, and E, and then here we have um, the different, um, let's say, the annotation of the genes uh, from these genomes uh, using broad metabolic categories. And yeah, function and no, interestingly, is the, the category most abundant, but this is, this is the protist world, and this happens. Uh, but many other categories, we didn't see a uh, big difference. So in, in general terms, we couldn't see that uh, the genomes of these organisms were uh, substantially different. So then we thought, okay, let's, let's dig in more into genes that might be um, related to some uh, ecological function, because perhaps there, I mean, there could be differences between these species. So um, we started to look at the genes in the lysosomes, and the lysosomes are organelles, uh, like here, that they contain hydrolytic enzymes. I mean, about 60, but depending on the, on the organisms. And the lysosomes are involved in the digestion of biomolecules or other, uh, let's say, biomatter, let's call it. So they are uh, pretty important for phagocytosis and for autophagy. And then we started to think, well, perhaps, I mean, there could be, um, um, let's say, the, the enzyme composition of these uh, lysosomes might be modulated in the different species uh, in order to, let's say, specialize or eat different food items. That was one of our um, hypotheses there. So then I'm, I'm uh, focusing here in the um, glycosidases that were present in the, in the lysosomes, and uh, those are uh, hydrolases that will attack glycosidic bonds, like uh, in, in carbohydrate, glycoprotein, glycoproteins, and glycolipids. And basically, they are quite important in the degradation of food. And remember, these, these uh, little organisms, they eat. They eat bacteria and perhaps other little proteins. So, um, what we wanted to do is to see whether different GH or glycosidase repertoire could be linked to different capacities to degrade prey by the different mass for species. So again, here we have um, mass for A, B, C, and E. We have the number of genes for each of these species. And here we have different um, well, carbohydrate, carbohydrate active enzymes. What we saw is that there were different numbers of genes for uh, these different mass for, although the proportions were not that different between them. But the numbers, in, 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 let's say the, the total amount of, of genes, they were uh, differing. Now, one interesting thing was that when we were grouping the mass for based on the repertoire of glycoside hydrolases, the grouping uh, were, uh, was not reflecting the phylogenetic history. Let's say we were having mass for A and mass for C grouping together based on the repertoire of uh, GH, but those are not the most closely related organisms. I mean, mass for A and C are not, I mean, this is a phylogeny, so these are not the most closely related. And the same thing with mass for B and C, they were grouping based on the G, uh, GH composition, but they are not the most um, phylogenetically related organisms. 
Then we uh, started to link this with what we saw before of the uh, geographic distribution. And one thing uh, was quite interesting was that species with similar GH repertoire, A and C, here we have them, uh, they were co-excluding each other in the ocean. While the species with similar GH repertoire, C uh, and B, they, uh, they were um, co-occurring. And here we have the previous network uh, that um, well, we, we did based on geographic distribution. Um, so based, I mean, using this information, we try to um, put forward one hypothesis uh, that is trying to explain how uh, mass four diverge, at least this species. So we think that there was an adaptation to different temperatures and also that the competition between species have promoted the, let's say, the biogeographic patterns that we see now in mass four, as well as their species diversification. And remember, this is one hypothesis. Uh, there could be other ones, but this is one of the most parsimonious ones. Um, so we have the uh, last common ancestor of mass four, and then um, from that last common ancestor, we think that mass four E was the first that diverged, and that species uh, adapted to or remained in cold waters. We don't know whether it was a cold or warm water species at that time when, when this happens. Then here we have the last common ancestor of A, B, and C. And we assume it's a warm species, probably perhaps living in the tropics. Um, then from, uh, from this last common ancestor, species C diverges and stays in warm waters because it might have been a better competitor there. I mean, it's adapted to that particular niche. And then here we have another divers diversification point. Uh, to avoid competition with C, I mean, these other two species, uh, they diverge in the niche. Um, species A adapts to colder subtropical waters, while species B stays in the same uh, geographical area that is populated by C, but it might have uh, changed it, it, its niche by diet modification by specializing in a, different, in a different type of food, then it could coexist with C. Um, so yeah, this is our hypothesis. There are uh, other ones, but it seems that it's one uh, possibility. Now, I've been talking about uh, species so far. Um, so mass for A, B, C, and E, they are well differentiated groups. But what about populations? I mean, populations are all the different individuals that are present within uh, each of those species. And why this is important? I mean, um, population variation might provide uh, insights on their reaction to natural selection. I mean, if the whole population is clonal, if there is a change in the environment and the, po the potential uh, to adapt to the new condition, it's much more limited as if the population has a larger amount of diversity. And this is quite relevant in the context of global change because we don't know how microbial populations will react to changing, uh, to changing, changing ocean or changing environmental conditions. So to investigate microbial populations, what we use is the analysis of single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. Here we have just uh, three hypothetical species and then what we look is at basically mutations between them, so point mutations. We use also something called uh, an index, the FST index, of fixation index. And to explain it is, uh, well, it's relatively quite simple. It's looking at the variation uh, between different populations uh, against the variation within population and then a division there. But we, have, we can have three different scenarios. For example, we can have, if this is one species, we can have two populations. And when the FST is equal to one, it means that there are two populations that are genetically completely different. Then if we have an FST of zero, it means that those two populations that we thought were different are not, are probably genetically are the same. And then of course we have a lot of values in between, that's real life, I mean all, all those values that are in between is the, what we get. And in those cases we see that there's some differentiation, genetic differentiation between different populations. Now, we try to detect SNPs from metagenomes, and 
I mean, um, most of you are familiar with metagenomes, but just, in, just to have everyone on the same page, metagenomes uh, are uh, try to, let's say, represent most or a good fraction of the genomic information for a microbial community. It's not everything, but it's uh, representative uh, from the most abundant organism. And basically what you have is millions of little sequences from uh, different genomes uh, in, your, in, in your metagenome. So we have different metagenomes that were taken from Tara Ocean. And what we do is to compare or map those metagenomes against one reference genome. And in this case, this is MAS4. So we compare the different metagenomes against uh, one genome and we detect point mutations. And uh, in this particular case, we use MAS4 and we have 82 metagenomes from Tara Ocean. The interesting thing was that when we started to do this analysis, we weren't very sure what we were going to find. Perhaps everything is randomly distributed. Uh, maybe not. But we start to see some structure. Here we have the different mass for species. And here we have the distribution of the FST values that we recover. Now, uh, when we have FST of above 0 0.15, uh, we could uh, say that there is a high differentiation. If it's, if it's between 0 0.15, 0 0.25, it's a high differentiation between populations. Above 0 0.25, it's very high. So, Serum values are above 0 0.15 for mass for A, B, and C. So th this was a hint that hmm, it seems that there is population structure here. So we need to dig a little bit more. There was not so much variation for mass for E, but I will tell you later a little bit more about that. I mean, it's a species of cold water, so it's, it, it wasn't well represented in our uh, data set. Now I'm going to talk a, a little bit of mass for a I mean, we did for the other species as well, but I mean, with one, I think it's good to convey the, the message to you. Um, so we try to uh, identify populations in, in mass for a uh, This is a map showing the sea surface temperature. And the, each of the dots is one station from Tara Ocean, from where we took metagenomes. The color of each station is related to one population that we define. So um, here what we have is the FST distances that were clustered uh, in a hierarchical clustering, and then the abundances uh, of the different um, of mass for A in the different samples, and then the number of SNPs or mutations that we could identify in uh, different samples. So what we do is to define groups, and we, um, those groups represent potential populations. I mean, everything with an FST below 0 0.15 was defined as a population. So we could define one group that is the blue, uh, let's say the blue group, or the blue population, which is here, which is the most abundant. And it represents, uh, the, let's say, the actual distribution of mass for A, what we saw with metabarcoding. So this was making sense. Uh, this, this abundant group represented, let's say, the most abundant uh, mass for um, species. Let's call it like that. But then we, we found another population in the Mediterranean Sea. Sorry, I mean, this is, was cut from the slide, so sorry about that. Uh, the Mediterranean Sea seems to harbor a uh, population mass for A that is quite differentiated from the, let's say, global ocean population. Um, uh, that is present in the subtropical areas. And then we have another population that uh, we are not sure if it's a population or not yet. We are still discussing. I mean, the red group, which is there, uh, it's in areas where, if you remember before, I mean, this is uh, the tropical areas is where mass for say is dominating and it's mass for B there as well. So we don't know whether this represents a uh, population with smaller abundance that is present in tropical areas, or it might be an artifact of when we do the mapping of um, the metagenomes that we are getting signal from um, an mass for. So we are digging on that, but at least two populations seem to be well differentiated for, for this species. And some similar examples are uh, present also for the mass for, but I'm not including them uh, here. Then we uh, were looking at um, the let's say the genes of uh, the different mass for species, trying to see where we could see any signature of uh, selection. 
So for that, we normally use this, um, let's say, the ratio between non-synonymous and synonymous substitutions for different genes. And in this case, when we have, a, let's say, a ratio of one, it's a potential indicator of um, positive selection, adaptive evolution. So here we have, again, the four species, mass for A, B, C, and E, and each dot here is a gene. And then what we were doing is um, putting the counts of non-synonymous versus synonymous um, substitutions for each of those genes across the 80-something samples of Tarawishi. What we start to see is that there are some genes that uh, where the number of non-synonymous substitutions is higher than the number of um, synonymous substitutions. So perhaps those genes are or could be uh, under positive selection. Uh, especially in mass 4, there are a few less in the, in the others. Um, so we are digging into that and we're trying to see where those genes could explain some of the population differentiation we see. And, and these are good candidates to try to un understand um, the adaptive diversification in these, um, in these populations. So if you, well, I mean, most of that work was done by Fran La Torre, who's finishing his uh, PhD uh, with me. We've been collaborating a lot with Ramon, with Olivier Jailon, and then a part of his work was recently published. You can have a look if, if you like. And the, the second part, let's say the population part, is still uh, ongoing. So hopefully in some month there will be uh, more news. Now, uh, one thing to think about, think about is when this variation emerged, because I have been talking about uh, lineages, populations. So these are different temporal scales. Um, when we uh, talk about phylogenetic groups, defined phylogenetic groups, we are mostly talking about microevolutionary uh, patterns, things that happened some time ago. It's difficult to put a number, but it's not something that recent. Uh, diversification of different mass four could be several hundred thousand years, million years, I don't know. I can't, I can't give a, a, a good uh, number, but it's not something that is occurring right now. But then when we are uh, looking at populations, we are looking at microevolution. These are processes that are occurring are at the smaller time scales. And this is interesting because at smaller time scale, ecology and evolution might be interacting. So evolutionary change might affect in ecology, ecology might be affecting evolution. And that's something that is, uh, we think is quite interesting. And this can occur at contemporary time scale. So evolution might be a process or is a process that occurs at contemporary time scale. Contemporary means, uh, let's say, decades, we could say, or years. And well, one good example of that is actually with COVID-19. So here we have, um, let's say, uh, the diversification of uh, COVID-19. And I'll put you a small uh, video. Let's see if it works. So COVID-19 started about two years ago, there. And there was a little diversification, but very rapidly, new strains started to pop up. You can see that each of these uh, points that pop up are, diff are new strains with different nucleotide uh, composition. We can see Delta showing up there. Uh, we can see, I think, Omicron is already appearing there before all the diversification of Omicron. Then we have Delta, huge diversification going on and, and dominating the population. And then uh, we can see Omicron there is still not very common, but then it starts to increase. So this happens two years. I mean, uh, to me, it was amazing to see that we could actually track evolution uh, in almost real time. Of course, this is a virus. I mean, we cannot translate this to a protein, to a bacteria, because, I mean, the variation is slower there. But it might be possible that the amount of contemporary evolution that we have, for example, in bacteria in the global ocean, it's more important than what is currently acknowledged. And this is something we start to look at in, in, in a couple of projects. Um, so the question is, is contemporary evolution going on? We can detect it in uh, marine microbes. And this is, uh, these results are quite preliminary. And uh, this was done mostly by uh, Patrick, that is doing the master here with me. So what we did is to, uh, we, we could retrieve a SAR-11 genome from Blanespay using long-read uh, sequencing, PacBio. 
And then we said, well, let's try to see where we can uh, see the change over time in that genome. And for that, we have 12 years of metagenome from Blanche Bay. So we said, let's compare this genome during 12 years. Uh, the genome was well complete, and then uh, what we use is, again, this ratio, DNDS, that I mentioned before. We compare synonym, non-synonymous versus synonymous mutations. Here we have the ratio. Here we have the year from 2010 to 2009 to 2020, I think. Different seasons, and we have one hypothetical protein that we put here as example. So what we can see is that there's a big variation on the NDS rations over time. I mean, for that specific protein that belongs to SAR11 in the different seasons, uh, there's variation in the ratios, but we could see that in some cases it seems that there is a trend over time. So if there is an increase of DNDS over time, this could be a suggestion of adaptive evolution. But again, I mean, this, we, need to, we are double checking this, we are working on that, so we need to confirm that. But it would be very interesting uh, to see if there is an increase in this ratio over time that could be indicating adaptation, at least in one specific gene for one genome, uh, to changing condition, potentially. So this led to other questions, which, uh, or is leading to other questions. So for example, if we assume that we detect evolution at Blanis Bay, which is one spot here, uh, what does this represent? Is this evolution in this single site? Is the whole Mediterranean Sea? It's a bigger area? So we don't know yet. But we're trying to, to see where we could identify the extent of the process. Then we're interested to know what are the exact phenotypic effects of those evolving genes, and also how microbial population will evolve as respond to, uh, to global change. And this is something we are working with uh, Georgina Brennan, who is a postdoc here at the ACM, working with me in, in a couple of projects. And we run an experiment in Sweden, because here uh, we had a COVID, so it was complicated. So during 14 months, we uh, tried to um, expose communities, microbial communities, to different conditions. And we are now in the process to see where we can detect uh, genetic changes in, in some of them that could be indicated adaptations to the different treatments. I mean, treatment, treatment simulating uh, um, global change, increased temperature, for example. So I cannot tell you more now because we are uh, analyzing data, but hopefully, I don't know, in, in a few months, there will be more results here. So we move now to the second question about which microbes interact and how. And this is a general depiction of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, trophic interactions in the ocean. Um, we have phytoplankton, so plankton fish. I mean, this is a typical, let's say, classic transfer of matter and energy in, in the ocean. We have uh, particular organic matter uh, sinking, and then we have some matter that is used by, uh, for example, uh, bacteria that, is, that are then eaten by protein, and this is channeled again to the, let's say, to the main trophic web in the microbial loop. The, thing, the interesting thing here is that um, there are a lot of uh, interactions here going on between microbes. So, these little guys are quite important to maintain uh, the interactions or the, or the trophic interactions between larger organisms in the ocean. But the thing is that we know very little about these interactions. And this is mostly a black box. We know a few, but most of them are unknown. And this is something uh, we've been wondering um, a few years ago, and we wanted to quantify how much we knew. Let's say um, we, we know that we don't know a lot, but how much we knew. And we, uh, what we did is to, um, let's say, uh, do a, by a bibliographic search. So there were two students working for uh, one year, uh, looking for papers. I mean, it's uh, uh, a lot of work, uh, going through about 500 publications and registering the uh, interactions. And these papers were from the last 150 years. And after all that work, we came out with this network. Uh, I want to just stress that this was mostly focusing in protein, so protein, 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 bacteria interaction, not bacteria, bacteria. 
So this uh, network came out, and this network contains all the associations or, in, let's say, interactions that we could detect. Some, I mean, each of these nodes is a, a group, and then we see that uh, taxonomic group. Some groups like dinoflagellates, ciliates, uh, diatoms, they are more represented because they have been studied most. But then we have all these other groups that, I mean, they are barely known about what they are, I mean, with whom they are interacting. And most likely they are interacting with several um, other microbes. So to try to uh, address this uh, lack of knowledge, let's say, on microbial interactions, what we do is to use association networks. And association networks can tell us good hypotheses of interactions. Of course, this is not, uh, they do not prove that the interaction is ongoing, but they can tell us if there potentially there might be an interaction between two uh, microbes. So basically what we do is just look at correlation between microbial abundances. I mean, these are two simple examples, two microbes which are correlated over time in their abundance, or two microbes that are not that well correlating or, or anti-correlating in advance over time. And with this data and some fancy uh, methods, computational methods, we end up with things like that, which are the networks, where each uh, dot or node is a species, and each connection represents a potential uh, interaction, positive or negative, co-occurrence, co-exclusion. So now I'm going to present some results of uh, what we did in, in in Blanes Bay as well, I mean, we use um, data from 10 years and we use that to uh, build networks. We look at um, prokaryotes and protists, picoplankton, nanoplankton, we use metabar code in there, and we, will f uh, we focus only on the strongest associations. So I'm jumping directly to the result there. Um, since we uh, use only the strongest associations, we basically build a core network, let's say the most important or what we think could be the most important interactions there. Uh, we have about 259 species, 1,400 associations, and then uh, even though those 259 species were 9% of the richness, they were more or less 50% of the abundance. Uh, and most species that we found were seasonal. I mean, here we have the networks, again, each of these uh, points uh, or dots, it's a species. The color is the season, winter, spring, summer. And you can see that the winter group seems to be better connected than uh, the others. Um, so it seems clear that, well, uh, winter associations seem more prevalent than, than the associations in the other seasons. Now we, we translate the same network. This is a different plot of the same network. I mean, this is to just show the different species that are involved. We saw bacteria were the most prevalent in that network, and that proteins uh, were, were less, about 30%. And bacteria and proteins, they tended to be associated with bacteria. Um, so this shows more or less the distribution of associations uh, we found. And of course, I mean, all these are, I would say, good hypotheses, but ne they need to be tested and confirmed. We also saw modules, and modules are uh, group of species or OTUs. I didn't, say, I didn't mention what is OTU, operational taxonomic unit, a proxy of species. So OTUs are uh, or species that were more connected to each other than to the rest of the network. So they represent tight uh, groups. Here we have different models, model one, model two, three. The color again is related to the different seasons. Uh, for example, there are several winter models. There are um, one summer module and one autumn module as well. Um, so th this could be, uh, these are good candidates to search for quite strong associations within uh, this network. Um, uh, the idea is to well, investigate at least a uh, few of these uh, associations. But then uh, I've been showing, I've been showing you static network, just uh, snapshots. I mean, this network is more or less the same or similar to what I uh, present before. It's a static network. 10 years of data and you get that snapshot. But actually, I mean, you could open this up and get a specific network for a specific uh, month. And when we do that, we start to see that this single object starts to show different patterns. 
for example, this uh, orange uh, cluster, which is present in warmer waters and disappear in uh, colder waters. So networks are, are changing over time. And this is a, um, a kind of video that Ina, my former student, did trying to show um, how the different clusters, uh, the blue and the, and the orange, they appear and disappear uh, over time. So that's something we need probably to incorporate in our knowledge now, the, 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 changing, the changes in the associations or uh, interactions that occur over time. Um, then, I mean, this is, uh, well, continuing with network, network dynamics, I mean, here we have, in this panel, we have the number of nodes for the networks for each month during 10 years, and we see that the number of nodes in the network, number of species in the network is changing, and this is the number of connections or edges over time as well, the same, different years, each point here is uh, one month, and we see that the amount of edges uh, well, changes over time. There are more, more edges in winter, less edges in, in summer. So this points to a change in, uh, or a dynamic, quite dynamic network. And these are other uh, indices that are used in, in, in networks like edge density, transitivity, average pack length, and so on, that they also show uh, seasonal uh, behavior. Um, so the interesting thing is that over 10 years, the network is showing recurrent patterns. It's not that every season you get a new network showing up. I mean, some, some things are new, potentially, but there are some connections that are repeatable, uh, especially in winter, where there are some associations which are recurrent. And the, the, the cool thing, I think, is that this network that we see, or for example, in one specific season, most likely will disappear until next season, and then we'll sort of re-emerge and, and, and form again. So uh, a networks also change across space. Uh, this is uh, just uh, to give you a glimpse of what we did here with, actually there's a tree there that you don't see, it's about 400 uh, samples and 400 networks. This is data from the Malaspina expedition and, and also from the hot mix expedition in the Mediterranean Sea. And these are different depths of the ocean. I mean, samples for surface, uh, well, DCM, mesopelagic, batipelagic, and so on. So based on that, we built uh, networks. And what we did here is to build networks for uh, specific basins or sub-basins, like, made, well, made, let's say, Mediterranean Sea, and basins like North Atlantic, South Atlantic, South Pacific, and so on, and for different uh, depth layers. Epipelagic, mesopelagic, batipelagic. Now, we, we won't go in detail on this because we could spend half an hour uh, looking at this, I think, but what we need to look at is uh, basically the colors here represent different taxonomic groups. Uh, and then what we can see is that if we move vertically in one, for example, Mediterranean Sea, we see a change in the predominance of some groups with depth. And the same with other basins. And when, I mean, this red uh, color is uh, our most like archaea, which is expected, let's say. So we see a vertical change, which is not the same in different basins. And we see, a, um, let's say, a change also in the horizontal dimension of the ocean as well. So networks change over uh, these two ocean dimensions. Well, I want to thank uh, Ina, who did a good part of, of this work. She is now a postdoc in, in Paris. Uh, and my former uh, postdocs, Anders and Marit, that did also a good part of the work. And now we enter in the last uh, question, which is how much functional redundancy is present in microbial ecosystems. And you might wonder why, why this is interesting. Well, I mean, there was a kind of, uh, there was a lot of discussion during the last years of whether um, uh, microbial communities in the oceans are redundant in terms of function or not, but I will tell you a little bit more uh, in the next slides. So functional redundancy. Um, the idea is that uh, we can make an analogy between a team and an ecosystem. A team and an ecosystem, they both need to work, right? And the question is whether uh, the species or the players in the team they are essential, they are redundant or not. I mean, what happens if we change uh, the 
players of one team, do we get the same results or not? What happens if we change the species in one uh, ecosystem? Do we, do we get different functions or not? So here's an example with Barça and uh, different formation of Barça over time. The question if Barça functions or not is not out of the scope <laughs> of the talk. Oh, this week. Yeah. Yes. This week. <laughs> so here you have different players so in the last few, let's say, um, seasons. So different formations, and if you start to look at them, I mean, you, you start to spot some players that are present in all of them, like uh, Frank, uh, Frankie de Jong and Jordi Alba. They appear in most of them. Then we had one that we knew that was uh, very important, but it's gone. We have it here. And then there are other players that I, I know it sounds bad to say they are redundant, but they could be changed, and well, the question is whether they generate different results or not. But this is the idea. How, what's the effect of changing components on the function of a system? A system, a team could be seen as a system, uh, and an ecosystem is a system. <laughs> so in order to look at this on, on, on micros, what we normally do is to compare taxonomic similarity with functional similarity. So let's say we have a bunch of different communities, and we try to see whether the change in the taxonomic composition of the different communities leads to a change or not in the function of that community. And how you measure function, well, that's, we will talk about uh, this in a bit. Now, if you see that um, communities change in terms of taxonomy, you have different taxonomic change between different communities, but functionally the communities don't change, we say they are quite redundant. I mean, there are different components that can perform the same function. But if we see a relationship between taxonomic uh, similarity or taxonomic uh, change, let's say, between communities and functional similarity, then communities are, uh, they have a lower uh, redundancy. So we were investigating a little bit uh, of this on uh, two neighboring time series, the one that I mentioned before, Blanes, and the Vanille Surmer time series. We use um, seven years of synchronized monthly metagenomes. We look at surface waters and we do analysis uh, of synch uh, syn uh, synchronic dynamics. And this is the question, how will we define function? Uh, yeah, there was a huge or large debate on, on what's the relationship between, uh, let's say, taxonomy and the function of communities. I'm discussing a little bit with Pierre Galland that he's, he's in Banyuls and he's been working quite a bit on that. Uh, we were talking about uh, on the level of resolution that we want to look at when we define function. So let's say we could define function of a microbial community in terms of, let's say, in terms of all the metagenomic content that we have from that community, in terms of all the predicted genes, and a bit of a spoiler, what comes here is all metabolic uh, functions. This is more fine grain, this is more core, uh, coarse grain. Here again, we have taxonomy, and in the y-axis here, uh, we have different, let's say, proxies of function. Now, when we look at the relationship between taxonomic differentiation of similarity, as, as you prefer, with all the metagenomic content, we get this very good relationship above the one-one line. I mean, this is a very good, uh, let's say, association there, a correlation. Now, when we look at the, all the predicted genes, that means, I mean, we are not looking at the whole metagenomic content. We're just using the genes that we could predict. Then we get the same relationship. Now, when we look at all the metabolic functions, things change. So these are broad metabolic functions that were annotated with this uh, specific uh, database. And as you see, I mean, we were, we had this relationship above the one, one line, and then we went below the one, one line here. And again, taxonomic differentiation, I mean, a substantial or larger change in taxonomic differentiation is leading to a smaller effect on um, the functional differentiation in terms of this broad metabolic function. So defining the level at what we define function is important to uh, to interpret the results. So I, I'm continuing with this now. Uh, let's say, let's assume that we have comparable communities, microbial communities, in these two 
time series, and that they experience similar environmental conditions. So we have these two hypotheses. I mean, if we have a high redundancy scenario, uh, we could have a low synchrony in taxonomic turnover in these two sites, but a higher or moderate synchrony in functional turnover defined as broader taxonomic functions. So we are in this coarse grain scenario here. Then we have this other hypothesis, which is a low redundancy, where uh, we have a um, high moderate synchrony in the taxonomic turnover of these two sites, and also we have a high moderate synchrony in the functional turnover. When I'm um, talking about synchrony here, uh, I'm talking about this. I mean, this is one example with the uh, near K gene, and then, or, or function, let's call it. We have the two sites, Blanes in reddish and black Sola time series. And we see that over time, this is time here, we have a good correlation in the two sites. But then we have the a AMT gene that is not that well uh, synchronized. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, these two um, systems are connected. I mean, they are not isolated entities, but they are connected through a current. This is a nice plot that Sergio uh, prepared from the Cosmo site here at the ICM. And when looking at different uh, degrees of synchrony, we, uh, we started to see, well, let's look at the synchrony of species, genes, functions, but let's start with species. We, we have, I mean, in the two time series, we have about 11,000 species or OTUs. And then we could identify different levels of synchrony. There were a few species, 1%, that were highly synchronous between the two sites. Then there were about 17% of species with medium synchrony, low synchrony, that can be identified here. Um, it's most of the species, actually, that have low synchrony, and a few of them as well with negative uh, synchrony. This is for species, and then when we look at genes, we get something kind of comparable. So what we observe with species, we, we see it also at the, at the gene level. I mean, the amount of syn synchronous <coughs> genes is about 3%. 25 are, uh, they have a, a medium synchrony, and, and so on. And moving to functions, uh, again, it's a kind of comparable um, a distribution. Here we have an average of 45,000 functions from different databases like EGNOC, PFAM, CORC, and so on. These are different databases that uh, we use to annotate genes and, and assign functions. So again, the highly synchronic, syn uh, uh, synchronic functions were, um, was the group with the, let's say, the, the lowest uh, abundance. And there were uh, other functions with um, medium synchrony, which were um, higher, or more functions with medium synchrony. And most functions, they had low synchrony. So th there is a kind of connection between what we see in species and functions. So it looks like we are in this uh, low redundancy scenario, although we're still discussing this. But it looks like um, uh, the important thing here is that we, we have different behaviors in the two time series. We have things that are highly synchronic, things which are uh, anti-synchronic or with low synchrony. So um, all those behaviors can be uh, observed there. And then we look at this, um, well, a number of uh, key marker metabolic functions. We selected 45 functions, um, and these belong to different metabolic pathways, like for example, carbon metabolism, nitrogen metabolism, phosphorus metabolism, and so on. And we also see a distribution there. There's a distribution of different degrees of synchrony for um, different functions. Some functions are uh, highly synchronic. Here is the synchrony degree going up which is a, 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 C, and B, and new K. And then there are other functions which uh, have a lower synchrony. And this is the taxonomy composition of the genes that contribute to that function. So uh, for each of those functions, there are a lot of different genes coming from different species that are contributing to that function. So we see, for example, this highly syn synchronous function is dominated by uh, archaea here. Um, so perhaps it's a K 
kind of trivial scenario because I mean the um, let's say that the dominance of or, or the synchrony of one species is leading to the synchrony of a function. So perhaps more interesting are cases where we have, for example, here or yeah, there, where there are more genes uh, from different species leading to the synchrony of function. Although normally we have uh, one or a few um, species leading the synchrony of the function. Um, then another thing we've been wondering is whether we could have a scenarios where the synchrony of a function couldn't be explained just by the synchrony of uh, the genes that are contained in the function. And this would be something like a, an emergent behavior, we could say, that uh, the sum of the parts cannot explain the whole, so to say. This could be in a scenario where we could think that, uh, well, I mean, there could be some sort of uh, randomness in the behavior of genes, but then the whole function will show, um, let's say, a specific pattern because, I mean, that function is needed for a system to, to function. So what we have here is, I mean, the same 45 functions, each of them. Uh, the size of the, of the bubble here is related to the number of genes that is contained or which are contributed to those functions. And, uh, we have the gene synchrony. This is um, the syn I mean, the mean synchrony of all the genes contributing to each of these those functions. And here, what we have is the whole function synchrony. Let's say when here we take into account the whole abundance of uh, the function, and we look at the synchrony. Well, here we do we look at the synchrony of each of the specific genes that contribute to a function. They take the mean. Now, what we see are cases like this where uh, the functional synchrony is higher than, or slightly higher, than the gene synchrony. So we might be spotting there are some um, um, synchronic um, kind of behaviors in the function that cannot be just playing by uh, the average or, or, or the, the, the synchrony of the genes in that function. And then we have other interesting examples like this one where uh, the synchrony of the genes containing the function is, let's say, it's a number that is not trivial, about 0.20 something, but then the functional synchrony is pretty low, or almost below zero. Now here, what we are seeing is, or we were looking with circular day, and then it seems that there is um, um, different synchronies going on for the genes within that function that sort of cancel out, and then when you uh, look at the just at the whole abundance, then the function is not synchronous, but genes in there, uh, they are. Okay, so I want to, uh, well, thank, I mean, a lot of that work was done by Sergio, a uh, lot of bioinformatics by Lydia, and then we are collaborating a lot with uh, Pierre, Jose Gonzalez, and also Pep on, on, on this work. And probably there will be some new results uh, soon. <laughs> So I'm having a few uh, take home messages. So the first is that, well, um, there's a, I mean, most of you are aware of that, that there's a large diversity of micro niches uh, in, the, in the ocean and those probably are driving population structure and looking at population is probably something that will become very important, I think, in, in marine microecology and microecology in the future, I mean, because now we can do it. Before it was pretty difficult to access up to population variation, but now we can access there. And probably we will get some surprises. Um, then contemporary evolution, evolution going on and time scales that are relevant for us, let's say. It's a bit anthropocentric, but yeah, that's our definition, let's say. It could be more important than we think. I mean, we could have evolutionary processes going on in decades in the ocean, and understanding those will be important for our understanding of the reaction of the ocean microbiome and the earth microbiome to global change. Then on microbial networks, uh, we need to probably uh, introduce the dynamic nat nature they have because they change over time. So we need to start acknowledging that and see that as a dynamic system rather than one static uh, object. 
Uh, about functional redundancy, well, it seems to be quite dependent on the resolution level that we are looking at. So it's important to consider that because that otherwise um, can lead us to different interpretations. So um, defining what is a function uh, and how we measure it, uh, it's quite important to um, understand the system that we're investigating. And then within micro items, um, we probably can have different levels of uh, synchrony. I mean, not just um, a few behaviors, but probably there's a range of behaviors in terms of synchrony, and that probably could be linked to uh, the importance of a specific uh, genes or a specific uh, uh, organisms in the functioning of one ecosystem. So I, I want to thank uh, a lot of people, I mean people at my lab, and then uh, the College of Marine Microbes here at the ICM. Uh, of course, co-authors, because without them it would be impossible to do all this. Um, the Institute, Blanes Bay, uh, the large expedition, Malaspina and, and Tara Ocean, uh, some institute that help us with part of the work. Uh, well, our computer cluster that has been working intensively to get those results. And also the funding agencies, and I want to thank you for being here. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ramiro, for this very comprehensive and extensive uh, <laughs> show of your data and analysis. It was extremely interesting. Uh, we have time for a few questions, and I will pass the, the micro around. Celia, she's very fast, as always. Thank you, very, very nice talk and a lot of work. Um, I, I was wondering, because when, when you do this uh, global analysis with, uh, well, with um, Malespina uh, data, and then you relate uh, this distribution basically with temperature, but do you have there areas where there is a strong seasonality and others that they don't have seasonality. And then you go to Blanes, which is an ex example of uh, mm, temperate climatology with a lot of, well, with a markly, with a marked seasonality, then you see difference. I'm wondering how much difference are due in this global analysis just because in some of them, uh, uh, are influenced by seasonality and you sample just once and then it can be winter or summer or I, I don't know if you <laughs> so um, we, we look at the at the general let's say we have the, the spatial and then the temporal uh, dynamics for, for populations so I was showing the dynamics for mass 4a in, in the global ocean and they are, of course, I mean, they are different seasons, but we didn't take into account the, uh, the temporal variability there. It was mostly spatial. So at that um, resolution, we could see that we could identify, for example, different populations, clearly one, one for the Mediterranean Sea, another one for, uh, let's say, the subtropical area of the ocean. And I didn't show it here, but uh, Fran did a similar analysis for uh, the Blanes time series, and we didn't see um, patterns that were so clear, let's say, for, for, for the mass four, right? I mean, there's variation, but we cannot see like clearly different uh, populations there. While in, at the, let's say, at the global scale, we could see uh, clearly defined populations. Uh, and probably it's because, I mean, it's, uh, the reason is that the extent of the sampling uh, it's, it's much broader, right? I mean, it's more likely to find population, I think, in the global ocean than uh, just in one specific site, although it could happen that, I mean, with bacteria, we see that there are populations replacing over time uh, in blindness, for example. So I'm not sure if I answer, but... Uh, <laughs> hey, great talk. Uh, um, I have a question on the first uh, chapter, but it, the, the idea percolates through, through everything. Uh, in the first uh, chapter, you find differences in the genes 
of the different uh, species of, or, or you suggest that there are differences in the genes, uh, this mm. is the evol evolution, but, but the linkage between these differences in the genes to the real ecological behavior of the organisms, this is something that is still we cannot, we cannot get. And, and this is something that starts to worry me, that we are finding, you may find evolution in the genes, but then how do you explain that ecologically? I mean, what change in the environment that made the, that allowed this, this evolution? What, are they, they, they are better adapted to what? <laughs> yeah, this is the... Yeah, we, we have the same question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we're trying, I mean, to, to look at the type of changes and we can, uh, let's say, assign some uh, uh, different type of uh, changes in the in a specific protein. So, for example, we could identify some genes that uh, they seem to be more affected by evolution than other genes. So we try to look at them, and they seem to have more non-synonymous changes than synonymous changes. So that can suggest evolution adaptation. And then we try to, uh, well, the next step is to try to see what effects they might have um, on the protein structure. And this is, uh, we, we've been talking with uh, Francesco about this to try to you know, model different type of variants of a gene and see where we could identify um, some, for example, structural changes. But then let's say the next step is the experiment perhaps. And, and, and of course, I mean, it goes like, you know, uh, quite a bit into the future. But I will say that here we are looking at the first steps to, to try to address the population variation and then, uh, for example, with experiments, uh, with modeling of proteins, we could try to understand what does, or what, what those changes mean for uh, ecosystem and functioning. But we could, for example, think that we could have some changes that lead to uh, locally adapted uh, genes or, or proteins, no? to function at different temperatures uh, under different conditions. But, uh, Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting, all the three chapters. And my question is for the second. And I am curious to know what do you include in these uh, interactions that you, for, when you did all this search in the literature, mm. what, what do you include in, in that word, I mean, the several interactions? And uh, if it would be possible to separate them and do individual networks of predation or symbiosis or whatever, if, if it would make sense. So the, the, I mean, the networks are, they help us to try to identify potential interactions, let's say. So these are all hypotheses of interactions. And of course, we can filter out a lot and keep only those associations that could, I mean, potentially tell us that, I mean, this is a, a, a real interaction. But of course it needs validation afterwards. And that, that's something we didn't do. And probably, I mean, will take quite a bit of work to validate in the lab, I mean, the, the interaction. But based on the taxonomy of the organisms that interact, we could provide a hypothesis of the type of interaction. For example, um, predation could be, or symbiosis. No? Uh, and of course, once we have, let's say, um, put the interaction, interactions into categories, the next step is to try to validate those uh, in the lab. But yeah, we can, we can, based on the taxonomy, we can provide a hypothesis of uh, the type of interaction that is, is happening. Uh, I forgot your second question, I think. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was only one, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I have also a question. Uh, I think the comparison between the two sites, uh, between Blanes and, and Banyuls, that's quite interesting. And I, you started with a map of the circulation of the ocean that the sites are connected. So one would expect much more synchrony between the sites. And still what you show is that the synchrony is extremely slow. No? The majority is low, but I don't know what it means. Hmm. But basically, there is very little synchrony between the two sides. Yeah, it's a, it's a distribution. Uh, there are uh, this distribution of um, things, let's say, or, or, or synchronies. So a few things which are quite synchronic, and then a lot of things which are not. 
So the sites are connected, but they are different. And there are some slides that I didn't show, but um, if you compare the whole, let's say, the whole metagenomic content of the two sites, uh, we see that uh, there are similarities, but there are differences as well. So they are not, I, they are far from identical. They are not two completely different things. And some species, they seem to be behaving the same in the two sites. And some genes, which are, I think, it's quite interesting that some some genes which are, uh, or functions that are, let's say, based on several different organisms, they are quite um, synchronized as well. But then there are several others that they are not. And this, one could think, uh, well, um, there could be a link with redundancy there. I mean, they, they are not redundant because they are not synchronized because, I mean, other organs are carrying out that function. Or there could be other explanations. Uh, if anybody has a, a last urgent question, and if not, I think we can just uh, thank you again, Ramiro, for your presentation. Thank you.